people who play barbarians where the outside of combat they start to feel kind of bored and helpless <laughs> right yeah it's like when i i don't get that complaint at all because <laughs> that's what we're playing on our swole coast thing is i've got a pure 20 totem warrior I don't want to do anything outside of combat. I want to hit stuff. <laughs> I want to get hit by stuff. Well, end of list. That works really well when you make an entire uh, mini campaign focused on the idea of hitting stuff and hitting stuff well. But if you're going into more of a tactical, puzzle oriented, social engagement I can campaign, hit puzzles too. <laughs> <laughs> I can hit people we're interacting with. I don't see the issue. <laughs> Welcome to Monsters and Multiclass, your Dungeons and Dragons fix. I'm Kevin Odie. I'm Jared Bornigal. And I'm Will Milden. And we'll be hanging out with you for a while to talk about anything and everything d related. On this episode, we're taking a look at the Barbarian Wizard Multiclass, Matt's course from the Monster Manual, and then another segment of Ask Monsters and Multiclass. So pull up a chair and stick around for a while. All right, so our classes today are the Barbarian and the Wizard. Barbarians are the martial class. Uh, Main class ability is just getting quite upset over things. Uh, This (laughs) mechanic is also known as Rage. This halves all physical damage and allows them to pump out a bit more damage when they hit on their attacks. Uh, While Raging, Barbarians cannot cast or concentrate on any spells, which will be real important for our conversation today. Then with wizards, they are the spellcasters of spellcasters. They learn the most spells of any class and can learn more in a way no others can through copying spell scrolls and books into their own repertoire. Uh, They can really become an unstoppable tool for any scenario. And I actually got to play a wizard for the first time yesterday, which was a good time. But anyways, multi-class requirements for today are going to be 13 intelligence and 13 strength. All right, so... I'm going to start with Will on first thoughts, because I know yours is going to be short. You're probably just going to hate this, right? Back in my day, barbarians couldn't even read out of the gate. (laughs) (laughs) How are they going to learn that damn book magic if they cannot read? (laughs) What edition was that where they couldn't read? That was 3.5, I believe. I I think the earlier ones had got even more ridiculous. There was some just dumb stuff back in the day, (laughs) but... uh, yeah, I mean, that's the kind of fundamental disconnect for me is there's definitely an attitude problem out of the gates where, <laughs> you know, Mr. Mister Rage Meatsack is probably not going to also be like, you know what, I think I'm going to go to a eight-year educational program to learn about abjuration. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What the fuck does that word even mean? You know? <laughs> They're not going to know that. Kevin, your thoughts? So, yeah, this is the quintessential bad multi-class. When new players are learning about multi-class, the example to give is, oh, well, you need to make sure you be careful. You don't want to do something like Barbarian Wizard. That'd be silly and ridiculous. Yet here we are talking to it. We kind of seem to have this odd devotion to sticking to a theme we set for ourselves years ago about we will cover every multi-class no matter what. And it's going to probably result in bad episodes But to be completely honest, I'm glad we do that to ourselves because now looking into this, it's actually okay. It's not amazing. It's not like Paladin Sorcerer or Paladin Warlock or Fight or anything, but it's it's okay. I actually think there's some fun stuff to be had. You do need, uh, as Will pointed out, kind of finagle the roleplay of it a bit. But yeah, from now on, my go-to is going to be, it's like, well, you know, you want to be careful. You don't want to go Monk Sorcerer. Because that's, like, actually worthless. Yeah. Or I think Wizard Sorcerer was probably the worst we've done. Yeah, that was Because really there's too. literally nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no point in it. All right. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that I'm, I'm in the same boat as you, Kevin. It's not going to be your greatest multi-class. It's, it's not going to make a, a gish that people will gush over. Uh, but it is... <laughs> hey, come on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, I should write that down. That's a good one. So, no, but it's it's not as mad as other classes are. And I think that alone makes it possible to do. With only 13 strength and 13 intelligence, it's not impossible. You still are going to have to rely on dexterity, 
to have any semblance of a good AC. But how important that is to you, I think really just depends on the, the type of character concept you go with. That said, I think with wizards having two subclasses that almost force them to be a little more melee focused, well... War magic, not so much, but with two that at least allow for for some melee focus. Um, I think that there's some interesting combos here in blade singing and war magic. So let's talk about blade singing first, because I had the opposite take. I was thinking, oh, that'll probably be a good one to look into, and then I can't see a single reason to go blade singing as a barbarian. So you get proficiency with light armor. Barbarians get it with medium armor. Uh, and you were talking about AC. I think uh, if you start as barbarian. Right away, two good benefits to a wizard. You get medium armor proficiency, and you get con saving throws proficiency. There are probably better multi-classes to get that if that's all you're going for, but that is right. definitely a benefit to a caster. So then with blade singing, so yeah, you get light armor and proficiency of one type of one-handed melee weapon. Well, barbarians, you're just going to get all all weapons. And then you get the blade song. We're starting at second level bonus action to start your blade song. And for a minute, you gain a bonus to your AC equal to your intelligence modifier, which that's probably the only good thing. Walking speed increased by 10 feet is okay, I guess, but you're already going to have boost to that because of your barbarian. Um, advantage on acrobatics checks. Kind of useless. You gain a bonus to any con saving throws you make to maintain your concentration on a spell. Bonus is your intelligence modifier, which you're not going to be concentrating on a spell as a barbarian. Right. That what was said, your Well, I mean... It's still good stuff. You're not, I mean, like, even without the um, advantage on constitute or concentration checks, getting the extra AC equal to your intelligence is just good. Uh, the extra walking speed, I feel like you're downplaying that at least a little bit because that just adds on top of whatever your walking speed is. And yeah, an extra 10 feet just seems to always be useful. Um, I think if I was going to do this, though, uh, I would probably end up going mainly into this blade song and then taking like a dip into barbarian, which role playing wise might be a little bit weird, but <laughs> we can talk about that later. What I, it, you're sacrificing a lot though. And that sucks because with the blade song, you can't hold a shield and you also can't use a two handed weapon, right. which is like, you know, if you're a barbarian, you're probably doing one or the other, most likely using that two handed weapon. Um, so you're definitely sacrificing a lot but it's not that much of a cost to use, and there's still going to be some. It, it there's still going to be some spells that you can cast to make this like weird mode you go into if you do <laughs> blade song and rage because you can do both. There's no reason you can't do both at the same right. time. It just takes two turns to activate. Right, because um, they're both bonus actions. Right, that's a little so annoying. It is. So in that time, you know, you can always you know first turn cast a spell. That's, again, not concentration, blindness, deafness, or flame shield, I think is, is a, a fourth level one. So you'd have to be higher level in wizard for that to come mm -hmm. through. And then you can, you know, have this like really tanky setup as your AC is boosted, your damage is boosted, you're taking half damage. It's probably not super worthwhile compared to just going straight barbarian for tank wise but it, it is like an interesting concept at least yeah I, I just i'd rather go another wizard subclass than blade song because there's too much that's wasted and then for this to come into effect as you said it's two whole turns to come online with it which is really kind of a big cost in fifth edition when a lot of combats are pretty pretty quick you know three or four rounds you'd have like a limited amount of rages so that would probably only be in like the big fights of the day yeah uh, I think something like War Magic gives you more just kind of universally helpful things like Arcane Deflection. It's sort of like a light shield in a way where you gain plus two bonus to your AC or plus four to a saving throw. Uh, it's a reaction. The cost of it is if you use it, you can only cast cantrips until the spell ends or until right. the end of your next turn, which if you're a Raging Barbarian, it doesn't matter. So there's almost like no, no cost to it. And you could use Arcane Deflection while Raging. It's not casting a spell. Right, right. And all it takes is your reaction, right? Right, yeah. And then tactical wit, you get a boost to your, your initiative, uh, which equals your intelligence modifier. And barbarians also get advantage to initiative, so you can get really get your initiative way up there, For which for a barbarian wizard, I think would be very useful. And that's Definitely. just two things you get right away. Second level is Warcaster. 
Or then, of course, there's the classic, go Divination Wizard, get your ports and dice. <laughs> Which is just going to be good. Oh, it wasn't <laughs> every time! Because it's always good. Yeah, no, that's the unfortunate thing. Right. Yeah. Now, that said, for War Magic, I don't see a reason to go past level 5 in Wizard on that. Um, the sixth level ability is that Power Surge, which I think in general is pretty weak on its own. Um, mm-hmm. That's where you can, like, if you counterspell or dispel magic, you gain a Power Surge and you can add some force damage to your next spell you cast or to a spell you cast. Um, it's, it's honestly not, it's not that impressive, even if you're a full wizard, because there's not that many times you're going up against spell casters or have a reason to dispel magic. And in this case, you're not going to be able to dispel magic if you're a raging barbarian. So mm-hmm. I think for this one, it's definitely going to be mostly loaded barbarian and maybe a little bit of war magic. At the very least, that two level dip at most five for third level spells. But I don't know if that's going to even be worthwhile. If you go to five, you'll get stuff like Fireball, which is nice. Which so, is good if you're not raging all the time. Or if you start out with a Fireball. That That's kind of right. how I'd see this play style going. So it's a bonus action to rage. And then m- most spells, you know, just an action. So you could start out your combat by doing an action to cast a spell and then bonus action raging. And then your next turn, you rush in and do your stuff. And I think there's kind of two main ways to take that. Either you cast a non-concentration spell... That it has a duration to do something to, uh, I guess, like blindness, deafness, or fire shield. I actually wrote down a whole list up to like six level of good one of these. I'll we'll circle back to that. Um, or you could cast a damage spell or an AOE spell, where especially if you're say war magic, where you have the boost to initiative and then the barbarian advantage on initiative, you're probably pretty consistently going to go high in the initiative order, which is really great to get an AOE off. Right. So you're one of the first ones going, if not the first one, throw a fireball on the group of enemies where none of your allies are there yet, rage, run in to start drawing their attention, and then you just kind of beat them up. Or if it's a big single damage, you know, it's just one big thing, you know, a more higher single damage spell, hit them with a bunch of scorching rays to start or something like that. Yeah, and it gives you a ranged option before you're up in the fight. Right. And it doesn't feel like you're wasting turns because, you know, wizards will spend their entire turn as I cast fireball. That's it. Your entire right. turn is I cast fireball, I rage, and I run up to start taking hits for everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. And that alone, I think, makes it pretty worth it. Yeah. So I think I'm, I'm with you. I definitely like war magic a lot more. Uh, it's it's also just very fitting from a, a role playing perspective. Uh, it seems like a barbarian who for whatever reason gets into magic and i think that's probably the the hard leap to get to um (laughs) but going into war magic is almost overly fitting it's just like oh yeah you want to learn magic what kind you want we got uh, protection magic uh we got conjuration magic uh we got magic that's specifically devoted to destroying your enemies yes that one (laughs) like (laughs) (laughs) on the note of protection magic though the ancestral barbarian and abjuration wizard are kind of the ultimate protector Mm -hmm. and again all this stuff best i could tell could be done well raging so ancestral guardian right away at when you first take it at third level you get the ancestral protectors where if you hit something while raging it sends your ancestors on them and then they have disadvantage if they attack anyone else other than you and then the abjuration wizard they'll get their abjuration ward which at if they use cast an abjuration spell, they could power this ward up and then use that. It gives them temporary hit points. They could use that to absorb hits and stuff. And then at a higher level, they could project it onto allies and help absorb hits as well. So this is that one that's going to come online to higher level because then also Spirit Shield at 6th level for the Ancestral Guardian is kind of the same thing, just a different way of going about it. Um, as a reaction, if another creature within 30 feet of you takes damage, you could reduce the damage by 2d6. And right. there's no limit on it. It just costs your reaction. And then same with the Abjuration Ward. So you start, you deplete your Abjuration Ward, and then you still have the Spirit Shield. Right. And and maybe at some point you're casting some Abjuration spells to, to get that back up. Mm-hmm. One big issue I've always had with Abjuration Wizard is less around the mechanics of this and more on the availability of Abjuration spells to cast. <laughs> um, there's really just not that many that you're going to use consistently. Things like Counterspell, as I mentioned earlier, are very specific use cases. Um, Shield is a great one. 
that is only level one and will restore your ward by two points just is nothing really impressive. There's no high level abjuration spells that are going to like really boost you back up to your ward being a a useful thing beyond taking that long rest and getting it up to, to full HP again. And that was one issue we found when, when we had an abjuration wizard in the party is they just, they were always trying to find a way to restore their, their arcane ward. Uh, and the only way rules is written that it was like easy enough to do so and worthwhile was taking an hour and casting alarm as a ritual over and over and over again. <laughs> uh, but you know, I think we, I, I mean, I don't like that. That's just stupid. I hated that. Like, seriously hate like we did that. yeah and we yeah, we didn't do like, it no we didn't we didn't i know but the it, just the entire concept felt so like when you're playing a video game that's not very good right? <laughs> and you're like all right i found the thing that lets me like triple my potions i just have to spend five minutes spinning in circles <laughs> <laughs> exactly and and that's just i don't know i think that feels kind of well, it, it is lazy game design to even let that work. All you have to do is just say, no, you have to expend a spell slot. Can't be a ritual, but whatever. Right. Yeah, actually, yeah, looking through abjuration spells, most of these are not wizard spells. I was thinking, oh, I know there's a bunch of these, but they're like cleric and druid spells. Yeah, yeah. There's so definitely seems... a few, like banishment is a fourth level. Wizard's definitely going to use banishment and stuff. Sure, sure. But it's concentration, and so you're a barbarian. Probably not. <laughs> Right, so you're going to run through that ward rather quickly, and if you're looking at going into a more high-level wizard or even just a, a medium split between barbarian and wizard, uh, I think you're going to find that your your ward is a lot less useful than you want it to be. Now, looking at how the ward is worded, though, it should still take half damage, or any resistances you have sound like they pass on to the ward as well, uh, because it says when you take damage the ward takes it instead. So to me, that reads oh, as hmm. though any resistances you have, which Barbarian Rage, would have that damage to the ward. So that's good. You're effectively doubling your ward's efficacy. Yeah, I didn't think of that. Um, hmm. Mm, I, I question that interpretation. I, li- I like the interpretation. We could just say, sure, that works. <laughs> For the sake of our <laughs> it build. It certainly powers it up a bit. Yeah, yeah I'd be curious, because I don't, I don't see... Anything that says that, except for with the projected ward, that one seems like it says that, ah, man, I don't know. I don't know. Somebody look it up. Pause. Yeah, according to God Emperor of D&D, Jeremy Crawford, it's, <laughs> yeah, resistance is applied after the abjuration ward takes damage, so that would not, not work here. Okay, well, that's a bummer because that makes the ward less useful, but those are the rules. And just like we allow the using a million casting of alarms to get your shield back, uh, we have to allow this too. But we didn't allow that. <laughs> that's my point. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, that's that's fine. So that doesn't work. But, you know, as usual, if you want to, go for it. Not that uh, yeah. we ever do. <laughs> right. <laughs> Tweaking the rules for fun. Ugh. Only if it makes things harder for players. Right. So, yeah, overall, I, I don't know how great it is to, to go into this when your reaction is probably better spent just using that spirit shield every single time as barbarian. The only real benefit that you're going to get from any wizard barbarian multiclass is the amount of spells you get at even first level. You get a ton of utility stuff that can be cast as a mm-hmm. ritual uh, or can be cast outside of combat. Uh, a lot of stuff that is just is just going to help any other time in in D anD D. Definitely, that's the other good good way to take this. Where instead of focusing on combat stuff, yeah, just give get your intelligence to its the minimum of thirteen, so you don't need to focus on that. And then you take out of combat utility spells, which wizards get plenty of. Because otherwise, barbarians don't have much utility outside of combat. It's what they do. They they hit things hard, and they could get hit hard and be okay with it. Right. So this is a good way to add, give them something to do outside of combat, which I hear is a common complaint for people who play Barbarians, where they're outside of combat, they start to feel kind of bored and helpless. <laughs> right. 
Yeah, it's like when I I don't get that complaint at all. Because <laughs> that's what we're playing on our Swole Coast thing is I've got a pure twenty totem warrior. I don't want to do anything outside of combat. I want to hit stuff. <laughs> I want to get hit by stuff. Well, end of list. That works really well when you make an entire uh, mini campaign focused on the idea of hitting stuff and hitting stuff well. But if you're going into more of a tactical, puzzle-oriented, social engagement I can campaign. hit puzzles, too. <laughs> <laughs> I can hit people we're interacting with. I don't see the issue. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. It is definitely great when, you know, if, if the rogue doesn't pick the lock and can't pick the lock, then the barbarian's always around to smash the door down. Mm-hmm. Or in this case, cast a knock on it. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> the refined barbarian. Yes. <laughs> Grugnor, take care of this lock I couldn't do. Yuck! Knock, knock, knock. <laughs> <laughs> Only it's much louder. Knock is like the, the 300 foot audible oh, yeah. blast. Which is basically a gunshot. <laughs> <laughs> a gun very specifically made to open doors. <laughs> so that, that's all wizards do when they cast knock. They, they pull out a gun and shoot the lock off. <laughs> that's the artificer. Yeah. No, it's like, hey, can't, can't you maybe use that and kind of like, no, no, no. This is just, this is just for locks. What are you talking just... about? It's not going to do anything to a person. <laughs> Look, and just points it at somebody, shoots it. Nothing. <laughs> Only on Blows doors. Head off. <laughs> oh, shit, was your dad a lock? <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Chronergy Wizard is also not a terrible choice for this. This is the new one in the Wild Mount campaign, the Critical Role. Not campaign, sort. The Wild Mount realm from Critical Role. Everything the Chronergy wizard could do they could do well raging none of this is cast in a spell so you have chronal shift you could um exert limited control over the flow of time around a creature as a reaction after you're a creature you can see within 30 feet makes an attack roll but ability check or saving throw you could force the creature to re-roll you could use this ability twice and regain any expended use when you finish a long rest uh you, you make the decision after you see whether the roll succeeds or fails which is very nice they must use the new roll uh, so that can be done while raging. Also, second level, they get a they also get a booster initiative rolls to their intelligence modifier, which again just nice, especially if you're going the route where you want to start off by hitting things with an AOE and then rushing in. It's really really useful to go first. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, if you take them to level six, momentary stasis um, as an action, you could force a large smaller creature to make a con save. Um, unless they succeed, the creature is encased in magical energy and they're incapacitated and has a speed of zero for a turn. You could use this up to your intelligence modifier for a long rest, which again can be done while raging. With that, you do need to be concerned about losing your rage because it takes your whole action. But Yeah, that's, those are both really good options. I didn't think about that with them not needing to be you know, spells. They're not spells at all. So I like that combination a lot. Um, I want to look at Graviturgy and say, like, oh, I wonder if that has anything, too. But that's just an awful, nope. awful <laughs> subclass. Nope. You can make somebody make light. It. Yeah. Also, that counts as concentrating on a spell. So you can't oh, right. go well raging. Yeah. Yep. Doesn't work at all, then. So you can't, like, making <clears throat> yourself heavy could have benefits. If you're trying to, like, go a grapple build, it's, like, really close to being, like, a nice kind of combo for a grappler. But it counts as concentrating on a spell, so you rage, and there it goes. Oh, and actually, you know what? It's just redundant. You get advantage on strength checks and strength saving throws, which you get as raging anyway, so never mind. Right, and you get some, like, negative, too. Your, like, speed's reduced. Yeah. So, overall, just just stupid. It's just yeah. stupid. Why did they need to reduce speed on that at all? Ugh. I'm so mad about that subclass. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not Why? good. Just- because it's just stupid. It's, yeah. it's poorly put together. It's like making it seem like this whole weight shift thing is so worthwhile that you need to change around your speed and you need to concentrate on a whole spell for it. And it's like, just mm-hmm. what's what's the point? Yeah, it's the, the cost of your con- the wizard's concentration is a very big cost. Right. Right. For and if you little gain. 
I'm not going to yell about it more because it's not the right episode <laughs> for this. And we already yelled about it. If you want to hear about that, go check out our Wild Mount episode where we literally dedicate an entire episode to just yelling about these subclasses. Uh, <laughs> so. The other ones are pretty good, actually. But <laughs> right, just right. yelling about Graviturgy and kind of gushing over the others. But yeah. <laughs> So let's let's talk a little bit about the the role playing aspect yeah. of this, because uh, I'm kind of curious on on what we can come up with there. Why would a barbarian turn to the the wizard domain? Do you think this is something that would happen naturally? Like they're hanging out with a wizard and they're like, "Hey, I like casting spells. This is kind of cool." Or is there like a something that that is in their backstory that allows them to to cross over here? Well, of course, it could be whatever, any of that. Um, I, I like the idea of they're they're born into a classic barbarian tribe and trained in that style of fighting and harnessing their anger, all very classic barbarian stuff. They then leave the tribe to go with their adventuring party for whatever they're doing in the campaign for. And now separated from this tribe, which doesn't really value intelligence and wisdom and stuff like that, they're now realizing that they actually... They actually are kind of smart. They, they have this sort of innate intelligence, this curiosity of the world. They have a knack for magic and magical items and now separated from that tribe, which suppresses it. They start looking into it all. Yeah, maybe there is a wizard or just a, some magic user, some kind in the party that trains them or they just seek it out on their own. And that's just kind of they start to learn that. Yeah, I, I like the idea on more of a, to some extent, comical side of like, a tribe that's very you know just like high school basically where they like celebrate the jocks and kind of make fun of the nerds and so they're good Mm -hmm. at sports so that's what they do but they still have like this secret love of all things nerdy uh and so they like spend their entire life just learning how to be a barbarian but then once they're finally separated from the tribe they can start to experience their their true love which is sci-fi and uh (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I don't know. Whatever else, magic, I guess. That's kind. Of, uh, that's not really. It's not entirely related. But this, uh, we see that archetype with X Men and uh, Hulk and shit like that. Super not a. It's like, yeah. Oh look, look, he's big and he also likes books. Right, right. <laughs> How'd that happen? Yeah. When your brain gets big, your arms get small. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's not exactly the most compelling archetype, but it's there. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And, you know, when we're presented with things like this, it's not about making the most compelling archetype. It's about finding where it's worked before. Because it has. I mean, it's it's not like entirely in a vacuum. Like, this has never been done before. And those characters can still be interesting. I'm, of course, presenting it at the most basic level of the archetype. But what you do mm-hmm. with the character and the, the interactions from there are what make it interesting. Do you remember the Fallout perk, Nerd Rage? Yeah, somewhat. It was like specifically a really good thing if you wanted like damage resistance and your strength to go up, but you had to be in like have a high intelligence to take it, which made it like this weird combo. But that's an once again, if you want that weird combo, it's there. Right. <laughs> yeah, and if you don't want to go the route of you're being oppressed by your tribe and like you said, it kind of feels like high school and jocks to nerds and maybe that it's too close to home for her. Some D&D players, <laughs> such as myself, you, it's more, you're, you're, it's another trope, but so what? That's what kind of D&D characters are. You're the special one in your tribe. Um, every, you know, every generation has the person who's born with like this alter intelligence and this otherwise barbaric tribe. And they're kind of groomed to learn magic and be the leader someday and that sort of stuff. So they kind of have that combination. I like that. Too. Or you could go the fun route of your wizard who then goes into barbarian because you lose your shit. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's almost kind of like what, what Will was saying with that Nerd Rage perk in Fallout, which I, I had to look up because I couldn't remember the specifics on. Basically, it's you're smart, you know, you have at least five intelligence and whatever else, um, and then once your, like, health goes down to a certain amount, your strength goes up to ten, and you gain a, a damage resistance. So that's, like, perfectly fitting for the wizard who, you know, you're starting to get low, maybe, like, 50% health, and you're like, screw this spell stuff, I'm going to start hitting stuff. And, right. you know, that's that's fun, that's cool. Honestly, uh, I think one of the biggest things about being a barbarian that's, uh, it's not overlooked, but it can't be understated, is, you know, when you're raging, you take half damage. That's, 
like situationally and just universally really, really good. And that's probably the best consistent way to deal with uh, maybe having a lower health bill. Right. Which, you know, a wizard is intuitively going to have some of the lower health in the game. Yeah. And in even just a, a small dip into Barbarian at least gets you a couple uses of Rage per day. Uh, so there's there's some benefit there. Again, if you're going that, that nerd rage uh, kind of play style. Yeah. Uh, this might be a bit of a stretch, but I've been playing God of War, the, the new one on, the, from, I think, 2018 on the PS4. You play as Kratos, and you have you generally fight with your weapon, which can apply elemental damage, and you kind of learn runic attacks and magical things. And it's all very much physical-based, but it definitely has this magic sort of bent to it. But there's this mechanic in it called spartan rage where it's a bar you build up and you can activate it and you basically throw your weapons down and you just go around and just beat the shit out of things with your fists and shields and (laughs) knees and legs and all that and yeah your resistance damage and you hit a lot harder and all that but you're not using your weapon so you're not using your runic attacks and the elemental stuff is not applied to it and things like that and that feels somewhat fitting too yeah yeah, I definitely see Noted that. intellectual Kratos. <laughs> <laughs> I said it's a little bit of a stretch, but Well it's it's not saying I mean that Kratos... he was good at solving puzzles and coming over difficult obstacles using his mind. It's not all brute strength. I also think that, you know, it, it's that's a good thing to base it on. It's like Kratos if Kratos was actually pretty smart. <laughs> there you go. I mean, what more do you need? Yeah. Any other interesting role playing ideas? Um no, I think we about stretched it. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could also always do stuff where if, if you, uh, when it comes to role playing, I always like, and I, we talk about this all the time, where I, I like it when it's the character is making a decision, you give them some agency, they're multi-classing due to decisions they made, uh, like, like the barbarian choosing to pursue their intelligence side and the magic and the softer side of things. But if you're not too concerned about that, the wizard who comes into contact with some sort of magic or spirit that kind of infuses with them, that gives them this rage and anger issues and stuff like that, that they now need to contend with. And they're kind of learning how to harvest that, harness it, not harvest it, harness it for good use on a battlefield. And so it's sort of like a uh, Dr. Jekyll, and Mr. Hyde. Yeah. Yeah. That, that idea of, you know, researching something and then finding a little more than you bargained for is, is interesting. Mm -hmm. So off of the role playing stuff, because I'm definitely out of ideas, you said you had a whole list of spells that work with this. Um, So I didn't go up super high level just because I felt like it's it's a multi-class. It's going to be difficult to be a super high level wizard. Uh, So the ones that I had to start, which is a much it's a pretty short list, was blindness and deafness, which we kind of already talked about and have talked about at length. An amazing spell that everybody should have. No concentration blind some people, blind multiple people, blind your whole party if you feel like it. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Their hearing gets better. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Blink is a third level spell that I particularly like. The whole concept is that you, you know, it's not concentration, but you can blink out of existence every turn until the start of your next turn. And that can just be great with that squishy wizard build, but now also you're just making yourself more tanky potentially. Mm-hmm. I, I Blink is on my list as well, but you need to be careful with that because often the barbarian serves the role of make sure you kind of get up in the enemy's face and you keep them there and keep them focused on you. And then all of a sudden, poof, you're just going for a round. And the enemy's like, oh, okay, I guess I'll go hit the, the warlock or the sorcerer or the actual wizard. Right. <laughs> or the wizard concentrating on useful spells. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and they it might. I'd like to see how that plays out in actual practice because uh, I could see it just shifting up the battlefield positioning because something thinks it's locked down by you and then it runs away and then you poof back and you can just sprint back over to it and get in the way and whatever. I, I'd like to see how that actually plays out, but you're right. You have to be yeah. careful with it. Other one I had is Animate Dead with a question mark next to it. Because Animate Dead officially <laughs> works. Yep. You, you, so there's no reason against it. It's a good spell. And if yeah, you go a Necromancer it's... Wizard, it really yep. works out well. Yeah, that was one I wanted to talk about too. Because it, it's an instantaneous effect. People, I think people kind of assume it's like, oh, you concentrate to keep these things alive. But it's like you cast it and animates. Spell's done. And then it's your bonus action, I think, to control them. Yeah. Uh, and then you have to recast like once every 24 hours to re-exert control. And best I could tell, they could 
be a raging barbarian with an army of skeletons and zombies and control them with bonus actions. And that's Just really cool. cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's like a great look. I love the idea of that. I think the necromancer that that macabre style just fits the the barbarian how's it pronounced M- M- macabre Mac- it's just macabre why Are do they put sure? so many letter- letters after it there's just an extra R. that's what the french do man <laughs> <laughs> i say that's why i always pronounce all their extra letters <laughs> they're like no that one's silent then then remove it from the word <laughs> this is america <sighs> oh there's i think there's two pronunciations okay hold on oh is that like when we do the sports teams and it's like the boston uh, celtics and then Celtics. that's not how you pronounce yeah. that word. So according to Google's like pronunciation, it says macabre. Okay. But it's when like in the pronunciation guide, then it has like a comma and then it just says macabre. So I, I don't know. It's not important. Okay. Well, this either is what way. you're here for, right? The- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually a critical skill for any dungeon master is knowing how to pronounce and knowing the meaning of very obscure No, words. it's not. It's totally not. Because you know what every other table does when the dungeon master mispronounces a word? They ignore it. You know what you guys do? You leave me strange. Bully the shit out of you. <laughs> ah, yep. That's a jam. All right. According to Wikipedia, the U.S. pronunciation is macabre. Or yes! U.K. is macabre. So it's, it's more, it sounds like well, a U.S. U.K. thing, like aluminum, aluminum. Seeing as my last name is French, I get a pass. Except for I said U.K., not French. It's a different word altogether in French. Shit. Wait, isn't it a French word? I don't know. I probably not. I'm trying to read the Wikipedia right, article this, as we're here talking and recording a podcast. I'm missing. Shit. I don't know. Let's move on. Um, okay. Anyways, that style for a barbarian seems very fitting. That macabre uh, idea of just obsessed with death, and I, there's definitely a barbarian subclass that is obsessed with death. Uh, which forgetting the name of that's the the zealot. Well, not obsessed with death. No, never mind. I'm sorry. That's like a rage beyond death, but. It like yeah. is all about being able to die and not really worry about it. <laughs> yeah. So I like that concept a lot of just yeah. you know getting up to level five with wizard necromancer, and then you get your animate dead, and those are I mean then you're gonna have zombies with twenty seven HP, and depending on the pile of corpses you rack up, that's a lot of health to spread out. Right, and yeah, you could you just recast the spell at the beginning of the day, which is if your main folk if your main actions in combat are raging and going into melee you're not really losing much by spending the spell slots on that right they will get up to 27 hit points yeah because uh i just played a necromancer yesterday so uh if whatever the zombie is the zombie's hp is 22 right you get your wizard level added in hp as well yeah I, i didn't realize they had a base of 22 i thought they were lower but no, no, zombies yeah, are... They have an AC of eight, so that's what's low. That's what I was yeah, thinking Yeah, zombies of. are weird. Yeah. And then they're difficult to kill because they have to... You have to either get them with a crit or they make a constitution save to potentially stay up with one HP. Right. And I think, yeah, it also it adds your proficiency bonus to its damage rolls, which is nice too, if you're a necromancer. Right. Yeah, so I, I think that's a good option to go for but it does not come online until wizard level five and if you want to be a barbarian probably you know at least three so you get your subclass feature so level eight that's kind of the type of one like i wouldn't start a level one campaign with the intent to do this because you'd be probably pretty crappy for eight levels (laughs) i mean that's uh yeah eight levels is bad but overall yeah the picture in your head of a necromancer it's not a first level thing you're just not there until right you, know, you get animate dead right and then also the second level necromancer ability grim harvest as a barbarian's probably not coming up too much where if you kill something with a necromancy spell you gain hit points right equal to 12 spells spells level or, or i'm sorry no yeah just any high level any first level spell or higher twice the hit points if it's necromancy three times Right. That's what it was. Um, I did misspeak as well. That uh, that adding the creature's HP and the proficiency bonus that doesn't come on until sixth level. So yeah. at just fifth level, it's a basic animate dead. So that said, I could see a four barbarian six wizard probably working out pretty well. You're not going to have that second attack, which I guess would be the big killer, but you're mostly would be focusing on on wizard. That would still be going with the idea of your barbarian rages are like your 
your your backup almost. Yeah. Your nerd rage. <laughs> Any other spells you had? Just Flame Shield, which I think is yeah. I don't have like anything much to talk about with that one. It's just good. It's- yeah, that was suggested by Tran Monk after right. he was on our show last time. And yeah, level four wizard spell. And it's not concentration. It lasts, ah, I should have wrote it down. What, ten, ten minutes. minutes. Yeah. Ten minutes. And you choose as a fire or frost. If it's a fire shield, you have resistance to frost damage. And anything that hits you takes 2d8 fire damage. And then vice versa if it's a frost shield. Which, of course, is really good for a barbarian. But Why did they name to, it flame shield? Right? <laughs> like, if you're going to give it the option of... Cold. I mean, either just make two spells, like here's Flame Shield and here's Cold Shield, or just make it Flame slash Cold Shield. I don't know. It... Extreme Temperature Shield. <laughs> Elemental Shield. Well, that's implying a lot right there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it can't be a Lightning Shield, Kevin. Right. Yeah. But also, yeah, why not? Why not just let you choose the element and say you're resistant to it? Well, you're resistant to the opposite. It's inverted. Oh. What's the opposite of lightning? Yeah, okay. Ground Not type. lightning. That's everything else. <laughs> <laughs> What's the opposite of frogs? Cinnamon. <laughs> yeah, obviously. <laughs> uh, one thing to keep in mind when you trying to base it around Flame Shield, it's a fourth level spell. Right. So you do not get a fourth level spell slot until seventh level in Wizard. Yep. Yep. Which so, is pretty, pretty far into it. And then you only have one. Yeah. Yeah. I think this works if you are going for that again, mostly into wizard and then a, a little bit into barbarian. Yeah. But I still, or you, I just wouldn't bother. Or theory craft. Yeah. Or theory craft and level 20 character. Right. Or, you know, you know, you're playing a one shot where you all start at level 15 and then you have tons right. to work with. I feel like that's yep. been happening to me a lot more recently. Uh, so <laughs> every time I've been like, oh, everybody just starts campaigns at, you know, level three. Uh, that's wrong. That's totally wrong. There's plenty of opportunities to to start with a high level character, right? So a couple additional spells like this I had. Some of these are real situational, but but charm person actually, it's the person has a save advantage on the save if you're in combat with them. But in certain situations where you could set it up, it can be cast on them before combat starts, and then they cannot attack you. So there is some combat utility to charm person. Otherwise, it's just out of out of combat utility. Uh, find familiar. So it's not really a concentration spell. That's another instantaneous one. You cast it. It comes into effect. You have a familiar, which you could then fully control while raging and all that. Do the help action. Give other people advantage or just more out of combat utility with scouting and stuff like that. Or if you need, you could also cast touch spells through it, which it will be a situational thing again. Right. But if you're the wizard with a cure wounds or something and... Somebody goes down, and but you're also the barbarian up front. Cast fine familiar. Wizards yeah, can't even up. learn cure wounds. Thought they could. Did no. they not get? No, they don't get cure wounds. That's the only place where the spell book has no overlap for window wizards is cleric stuff. Yeah. Oh, you're right. Though Never I mean, mind. oh yeah, yeah. Wizards else. really don't get healing. Yeah. No. I say pretty much literally everything else. But right. <laughs> I forgot. Yeah, wizards don't really get healing. All right. Never mind on that one. But still, fine familiar. Just kind of a universal. Yeah. Not, it's good. Not so much combat. Yeah, but in terms of combat, like Grease, Sleep at lower levels, at least. Uh, you could have a snare up to pull someone out. Blind the Stephanus, as you said. Mirror Image, which I think would be a better pick than Blink. Yeah, that makes sense. That's not Concentration? Nope. Oh, that's really because good. Because I think it makes it one of like the better spells in the game, because it's not Concentration. Yeah. That's when you make three duplicates of yourself, and when something goes to attack you, it has to uh, roll below a certain number, and if it doesn't do that, it hits one of the duplicates, which then is destroyed, and then the number gets easier to pass, but really great uh, defensive spell. Awesome. See Invisibility, which will have situational uses, but you can have it. Animate Dead, as you said. Blink, as you said. Magic Circle. I didn't think. For some reason, I didn't think Wizards got this, but that takes a minute, I think, to cast, so you need some setup for it, but... That's mm-hmm. when you can like trap something in it or keep something out. That's like fifth level. Yeah, we're getting higher here. Okay. <laughs> charm monster for the same reason as charm person. Fire shield. Create undead, which is just kind of like a higher level animate dead. True scene, give yourself true sight or crown of stars, which gets to seventh level. Uh, that's when we have the star circling in your head. It's not concentration as a bonus action. You get to launch one out. It does like 40, 12 damage or something. Yeah, really that's pretty like good. That. Yeah, and I did stop there because I realized I'm at 7th level and we're getting kind of nuts. But Right. <laughs> uh, and then there is one spell I want to talk about, though. It's a 6th level spell, Contingency, which is 
Interesting. So contingency is you cast it, and when you cast it, you cast another spell and choose a set of conditions that make that spell activate. So mm. when you do it, you you expend both spell slots, and so then this contingency lasts for 10 days. So you could do it before a long rest or something at the beginning of the day during downtime, and then for 10 days you have this contingency up. And so you, it could be something as simple, if I am fully submerged in water, cast water breathing on myself. Mm. And it just goes off. It doesn't expend a spell slot or anything like that. It does need to be a spell that targets you. So it can't be like a damage spell or something. But you don't cast the spell. I didn't see any wording anywhere that said you cast the spell when the trigger happens. It said the spell comes into effect when the trigger happens. Right. So you set up contingency while not raging. And then it could still, in theory, the spell gets cast on you while you're raging. Um, you can't be concentrating on it right. because it's, you know, if it's a concentration spell, that still comes into effect. Right. So there could be some creative uses. Yeah. That is a really fucking weird way to get around the rage restriction. Yeah, and it is limited because it has, again, it has to target you. It has to affect you. So it's not like if I get surrounded, I throw a fireball down or something. It's <laughs> Since wizards don't get healing, that's not something you could do. But Yeah, unless you're centering that fireball on yourself, just right on you. Internally, that fireball's happening. <laughs> no, I don't think that would work. No, I don't think so either. But uh, no, yeah. that is interesting. I... I I agree. You could probably find some some neat uses of it. Yeah. So, for instance, uh, the blink. That's gonna be one or a mirror image you know, right. here because that right. affects you if you're getting surrounded, fall below certain health, trigger a mirror image, dispel magic because that 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 can target you. So it, it's it, the wording is kind of weird. It's basically saying the tar- spell has to target you. If it could target other people and you, when this happens, it only targets you. Okay. So you could dispel magic on yourself. Uh, remove curse, dimension door. If you need to teleport away, fire shield. What level is contingency? Is it six level? Six. Okay. Yeah. So this is like high level stuff. I wish it lasted a little more than ten days because I could see some like a character that's entirely devoted to just like setting up for any weird triggers that might happen, where they like spend all of their spell slots just one day trying to account for every single scenario that might happen. Uh, you could only have one. Oh, one time. at a time. Ah, uh, bummer, bummer. Well, never mind. That would have been funny, though. Yeah. <laughs> I hate when the rules get in the way of my fun. Yeah. Oh, and the spell has to be fifth level or lower. Okay, that's that seems fair. Yeah, casting time of one Ashkin, and that could target you. What a well-balanced spell that I completely respect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it, yeah, since it's sixth level, it's when we don't come across much, because you don't get to that high. But it's definitely an interesting spell and some combos oddly with the barbarian yeah <laughs> and, and i'm sure there's other more creative uses i haven't thought of but yeah i mean beyond that the fact something that to consider there's only one you can only have one on you at a time it does make it a little hard to account for what might come up you know like you said the water breathing one uh, unless i know that tomorrow i'm going to need to potentially be underwater then i'm not going to bother i'm just going to prepare water breathing and i'm just going to cast it on myself and everybody else who needs it as well. So I think when you mentioned with things like damage triggers, having it so that mirror image automatically gets cast when you hit half health, that to me seems like a much more worthwhile use for it uh, beyond any other type of uh, of use. Right. Yeah, and it happens no matter what. You can't choose to ignore it. Right. So there's something to keep in mind. Right, so if somebody dumps a bucket of water on you, you're accidentally able to breathe water for an hour. Oh. Yeah. Uh, whoops. <laughs> Shouldn't have taken a bath. <laughs> <laughs> Any other spells? Nope. All right. <laughs> but I think, though, that's that's a lot. And it's this is, as we mentioned earlier, the type of combination that people initially scoff at because it just sounds so ridiculous. But there's at least enough here that you're not going to have an overpowered character by any means, but... It's an interesting one, and at least there's that. Better than, like, a straight rogue swashbuckler. <laughs> Do you not like the swash- swashbuckler? I just wanted to choose just some class. I don't know. That's Swashbuckler. It's just um, a somewhat boring one to me. Yeah. For no, no big reason. If somebody wants to challenge me, that's fine. What is boring about it being a pirate? It's not a pirate. <laughs> it's not a pirate. 
are gonna don't please will every time you say that i get another message on twitter or reddit or something of somebody telling me actually swashbuckler <laughs> refers more to a lifestyle <laughs> a career it's like i don't care man i don't even read any of the things in the book it was <laughs> good information though <laughs> All right. Uh, any other closing thoughts on Barbarian Wizard? Will did we did we bring you around? Are you convinced? I no, because <laughs> like I knew this wasn't actually going to be bad. It doesn't it doesn't like destroy its own core utility with its own abilities so much, but it just kind of becomes like a grab bag where you're looking for your wizard subclass things that are always useful, and it's like eh, eh. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. All right. I'll take it. Eh. All right. So before we move on to our monster of the week, have our promotional minute. Uh, if you are not yet, make sure to uh, subscribe to us and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, also follow us on Twitter at monsters underscore multi or subscribe to our subreddit, our monsters and multi class. Uh, and if you're looking for ways to support us and, and keep this whole show going, and also helping us transcribe episodes so that we can reach more masses, uh, then go to monstersandmulticlass.com forward slash support. There you can find things like our Patreon. You can find our dice affiliates and merch so that you can wear the coolest Monsters and Multiclass swag. Uh, and with that, let's go ahead and get into the Manticore. For this episode's monster, we're taking a look at the Manticore, a real classic nasty sort of beastie. It has a humanoid-type head, lion body, wings of a dragon, terrible spikes that it flings out and attacks people from a distance. A relatively straightforward monster, but I think could be a memorable and fun fight, especially if you used in the correct encounter design. So let's dive into it, guys. <laughs> sure. I, I always love monsters like this. I feel like it's a, almost a, a lost or a missed opportunity if a campaign doesn't at least have one Manticore fight. Uh, I think I've actually thrown one into this recent campaign with you all fighting one in an arena, I think. If not, I meant to. Either way, uh, <laughs> they're just such great challenges for, for low-level parties or even mid-level if you're looking at a, a grouping of Manticores, which is very open to, to possibilities here. Uh, so it is a challenge rating 3, which is not super high. Armor class of 14, HP of 68, which is pretty good. And then for speed, interesting to note is that it has a 50-foot fly speed, which is going to be very important uh, in this entire combat. For stats otherwise, nothing too impressive, but... 17 strength, so plus 3 strength, plus 3 dex, plus 3 con, minus 2 intelligence, plus 1 wisdom, minus 1 charisma. Eh, okay, it's it's a beast, so that makes sense. That's usually about how their, their stats are lined up. Um, I think it's somewhat interesting that it has such a low intelligence, only because it does have the ability to speak common. Uh, and it, it seems like yeah. it does have the capacity to I reason. Mean, it's a seven intelligence. Like a lot of PCs have an eight intelligence. That's fair. That's fair. So it's not like, you know, will levels of dumb. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's all he's got. Just, hey, man. You watch it. Man. Watch it, bud. <laughs> and Dumping intelligence is smart. You guys are the dummies. <laughs> <laughs> And then for its actions, it just has multi-attack. It makes three attacks, which is quite a bit for a challenge rating three. Yeah. Uh, one with its bite and two with its claws, or three with its tail spikes. Its bite is plus five to hit, reach of five feet, 1d8 plus three piercing damage. Claws plus five, five foot reach, 1d6 plus three slashing damage. And then its tail spike is plus five to hit with a range of 100 feet and regular 200 feet out to disadvantage. And does 1d8 plus three piercing damage. Yeah, and that range on the tail spike is quite impressive. Uh, mm -hmm. Based on the description of, of how this thing fights, I really expect it to be just like super annoying for players, uh, where it's going to be staying back as far as it possibly can, uh, you know, 100 feet or so, just shooting out tail spikes uh, until it sees an opportune moment to swoop in and actually go in for a kill. Otherwise, it's just going to keep sitting pretty, you know, 50 feet up and shooting those tail spikes as much as it wants. 
right at 100 feet up 100 feet up yeah sure whatever I yeah mean, it's just start getting yeah. out of range which can be a really frustrating fight for your martial characters especially at low levels where you're not going to have like a, a wizard who's ready to cast fly on everybody so it's like oh this manticore won't be a problem that's that's going to be not to mention the inherent fragility of that strategy when the wizard takes a tail spike to the face. right <laughs> right they can cast fly on somebody else though like the wizard can... yeah i know it but if you want like multiple right. people you know? right 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 where yes you now have your your fighter 50 feet up in the the sky and then the wizard gets a tail spike in the face and now the fighter is is dropping 50 feet yeah that's yeah not not a great combination no <laughs> Yeah, this is one where it's kind of decept- deceptively deadly, specifically because of its fly speed and its ranged attacks. Like I legit, I mean, it's challenge rating three, but I, I think if you, if this thing is like a random encounter out in an open field where the DM plays it smart, I think a level three party would could potentially really struggle with this. Yeah, with some bad rolls, I could very well see that happening. And if they're ill equipped and you play it like a jackass, it. It can, it becomes arguably impossible. You know, a pure martial party has very limited options to deal with this, especially if there's not a ranged specialist in the group. Luckily, there's a way out, even for the party who is ill-equipped. Uh, it specifically states in the lore that the Manticore does have the capacity to reason, and I could very well see if the party is on the ropes and, uh, you know, about to have a TPK, uh, they'd be willing to offer up a whole bunch to the Manticore in order to escape. And this is a creature that is going to let them as long as the offer is good enough. Um, I would say that you would need to make that explicitly clear to the players. Uh, and maybe that's something that you even say like in a, a brief lore dump at the beginning of the fight. You have somebody roll a history check and you just let them know like, hey, this is what you know about a Manticore. Specifically when there's stories of when their prey is backed into a corner, they can make deals in exchange for, you know, bringing them a whole cow to eat uh, that they'll leave these people be. Right. Yeah, the, the three tail spike attacks on a low level party is just, if all of them hit, that's 3d8 plus nine damage. Yeah. that That's nuts for like a level two or three party. So and you, the limitation is 24 spikes, which is a lot of spikes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it does have, rounds. specifically say, yeah, it only has 24 tail spikes, and it, it will regrow them on a long rest. Right, but that said, I mean, that's that's eight rounds straight of them just shooting tail spikes out. Chances are, even if only half of those hit, you're probably knocking down most of the party, or at least enough that it's going to feel comfortable to swoop down and start biting people. Right, yeah, it's flying up there. You know, you have your ranger or rogue with a longbow that's shooting at it. Just rain down 3d8 plus 9 spell tail spikes on it, which averages 23 damage. And yeah. One or two rounds. Yeah. Take it out. Right, and that's, I think, super fitting as well, just for its, its style. Again, that idea of just staying as far back as possible until it feels like it can get comfortably close and go in for the kill. Uh, so as a DM, you're you're well within your right to do it. You just have to be careful and have to note that if if nobody has any good ranged attacks in your party, just be prepared for for this to turn south very quickly. Right. Or it's a kind of a setup encounter. I think Prince of the Apocalypse did this. We didn't get very far in that campaign, but I remember the encounter where we, we were very low level and we joined a Manticore hunt. Well, you DM'd that. Does this sound familiar? I think I made that up. Oh, did you? I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, I remember joining a Manscore hunt and we were given like griffins to ride on or something and we went to hunt down like two or three Manscores and like part of a group. And yeah, that was, that was kind of cool. Because then you, you, you all have a fly speed. Right. And you have to control the griffin and go hunt this thing down. It was... Yeah, that's that seems reasonable. So yeah, if there's a setup there where you know you're going to fight a Manticore, then that's perfectly reasonable. And I think that's a good way to do it, too. I could very easily see manticores being creatures of legend, uh, having people needing to hunt them down. Even if they're just kind of terrorizing an area, then that's a great reason to send out a party of adventurers to just deal with it. Right. So in addition to that, these kind of random encounters are just 
party versus the Manticore. As you get higher, the Manticore could absolutely be part of a larger fight. Right. Because as Jared said, like it speaks common, it has an intelligence of seven, it could be reasoned with, it could be recruited to fight with goblins and orcs and bugbears and whatever else, as long as it's treated well and gets, you know, fed. <laughs> Yeah, adequately. Basically, that's its main concern. Get it, enough food. There's really not much of a limitation. If you want to add this thing as a minion to just about anything, I think that it works out pretty well. Right. And so that can make it can really bolster some otherwise basic fights like a goblin fight. And, and when we did the goblin night episode, we covered specifically goblins. We did learn there's definitely a lot more you could do there. So as like kind of the end, you're trying to clear out a goblin camp or something and you have the goblin boss and the goblin minions and then this manticore is released from a cage and it flies above you 100 feet raining spikes down as you're on your party as you're also trying to fight off the goblins. And why not have a goblin ride it? It's large. Yeah, oh yeah, have Yeah. So now you've got goblins with fly speeds. Right? And I think they're small. I, I don't know how that works. Can you have two small creatures on a large one? Does that matter yeah i think there's a rule about it i'm trying to remember it's too i'm I'm just gonna say i don't don't care like if you want to throw two goblins on there i'd put yeah i think it's very reasonable to put two goblins on this thing right like pulling off its tail spikes and using that as as ammunition for their bows or like as javelins so that you get like extra i feel like that would upset the upset the man i don't know it seems like it can easily shed these things it regrows them every 24 hours it has them growing out of its head, for Christ's sake. I mean, just pull those out. <laughs> yeah, that, that'll give you. <laughs> and maybe it does upset them. That sounds like a hilarious midway issue to deal with, is the manticore just turning on the two goblins riding it. Like, oh man, the, the flying goblins thing was too far. I, I gotta fix this as a DM. All right, goblins, pull it out, upset the manticore, and the manticore just eats the two goblins out of the sky. Right. <laughs> barrel roll. Just yeah. does a barrel yeah. roll. <laughs> Those are the creative ways to get out of holes you uh, you set up for yourself. <laughs> oh man, I'm like completely unbalanced encounter. What am I gonna do? Oh, they attack each other for like one. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Now my players don't know I'm a dummy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, but yeah, any, anytime you want to add something where it range, good, really range damage and mobility, man, of course, a good thing to throw into. Yeah. Just about any fight. You're saying how much average damage? That was 22 or 23. Yeah, it's something like okay, 22 it, or 23. Whatever. 20 is damage per round. Uh, the only thing that you're going to be missing out on is it's only got a plus 5 to hit. So if you're trying to throw this against a higher level party, it's going to be a pretty low chance that a ton of these hit, at least with my rolls as a DM. Uh, <laughs> I mean, plus 5 just is not going to be enough to consistently dole out damage. You might have 1 to 2 of those spike tails hitting per round. Um, but that said, there's no limitation on how many manticores you throw out. If you want to have 10 manticores, then great. This is still going to be a challenge or something to deal with for a higher level party. Maybe they have to you know, throw a fireball up in the sky, which is only hitting a couple manticores or waste spells to ground them or whatever. It's it's just going to be annoying. Oh, that's a that would be a fun conversation for the DMs. Like, well, all right, now that it's actually a sphere and what are the implications yeah. there? Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember the the there was a new graviturgy spell that they added that like makes like a, a forty foot column up or something and like forty feet wide. I don't remember the spell, but that would be an awesome one to use on a a flock of manticore. What do you think they call it? A grouping of manticore? Are they a pride? Is it like lions? I don't know. Yeah, I'd probably go for pride. Okay, they have lion bodies. Yeah, I can. Then the other thing, like. Dragon wings, there's, there's not like a word for a group of dragons, and then humanoid head, and it's just... A grouping of dragons is called a fight. That's what that's called, because they, <laughs> they don't want to hang out. Yeah. Right. Anyways. <laughs> so one-liners are really killing it today. Oh, yeah. Killing something. So, tons of options to use this. But yeah, it does... It fills a unique niche uh, of flying ranged monstrosities. Right. So if you're looking for that, there's not a whole lot else on the table. And it just feels well designed. I, I, beyond the fact that it does a little bit more damage, I think, than most CR3s you're going to see, uh, it just it feels good. It's it's a very again, well-designed stat block here. So overall, it is a pretty basic monster, but we did want to talk about it today because it kind of leads into our question of this episode, Ask Monsters in Multiclass, dealing with 
action economy and then specifically adjusting monsters to make them more interesting fights based on the Matt Colville video. I don't know if you want to just jump yeah, into I'll that. Yeah, I'll just read the question. Uh, rather yeah, than I was going to say. You, yeah, that's what I was getting at. All right, so this is from Star Shinobi. Uh, this is, how do you guys manipulate action economy as DMs to make combat more interesting? How do you feel about Matt Colville's villain action and action-oriented monster system or running the game number 84? Uh, and what kind of action-oriented monsters would you create? Um, so if you have not seen that Matt Colville episode, first off, check it out. It's really interesting. Provides some great insight into how to design monsters as a DM. Uh, but to give a quick summary, it's basically trying to tell people to, to step away from the stat block a little bit. Uh, and don't worry about what's normally put into, uh, you know, a a well-crafted book that needs to be perfect and sold to many, many people. Sometimes it's okay as a DM to just make a monster that fits really well for your specific encounter and what ideas you have around it. And this involves doing things like giving it more reactions or making something happen every single turn uh, that's less of a, a legendary action and more of just like a, a villain action that, you know, at the end of the 10 on the initiative count, it's going to do this thing. Or maybe even in later stages of the fight, it starts breaking out into bigger and, and harder scenarios uh, or, or just methods of attack that might be more desperate or just whatever, reflect the, the play in some way. So that video alone is, is super great. But before we even get into that or manipulating uh, our own monster, uh, how about this of how do you guys manipulate action economy as DMs to make combat more interesting? I think we've talked a lot about action economy, but this is a, a bit of a different way of phrasing it. Yeah, the so in 5th edition, action economy is huge. It, it's almost everything in a fight where action economy referring to how many actions a side has in a round. So if you have a party of four, their action economy is four. And then if you face them up against one monster... It has an extra economy of one, and your party's probably just going to stomp it into the ground unless the challenger ended is so much higher than it. So you always need to balance that. One way I like to go about it is start out combat with a slight balance in favor of the enemy so it could feel a little scary and a little overwhelming for the players. But some of the things are weaker, and if they're being tac good tacticians and kind of paying attention to it, they'll realize, all right, let's focus fire on the weaker things, kill those real quick. So we tip the action economy into our favor. And then you kind of get, the players get this momentum and a snowball effect. And I think it kind of makes for a cool encounter feel where it's this desperate struggle to start. They're like pushing a boulder up a hill. And then finally they hit the crest of the hill and it just takes off. Yeah. And I think that that has played out really well in our games. And I, I love that feeling as well. Um, I also, what I love about it is it gives the villain time to actually do something uh, where there's going to be three or four rounds of just minions being taken out or whatever being dealt with. Even if it's, it's something that isn't um, just minions, maybe it's opening a door that needs to be opened or destroying some crystals that are protecting the bad guy from being uh, able to be attacked or whatever you can think of. Um, but something in place to let the villain do some stuff because nothing sucks more than making this interesting encounter with all of these cool actions and abilities. And it takes the, the PCs one good initiative role to just completely shut that down. Uh, so things of that nature of just putting obstacles in the way before the bad guy can, can really be targeted is, is a great way to, to just make sure the action economy is, is in the DM's favor at the start, at least. Yeah. My personal take is if you, without severe modification of what's in the book, your best bet is just vanilla, give them more actions via monsters. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where, I mean throwing on legendary actions to any creature uh, comes into play. A goblin boss can have legendary actions if you want it to, and maybe it's just one. I think that we constantly see legendary actions following a very specific format of you get three legendary actions, and one of them is to attack, another's cast a spell, another one's to move. 
but you can really shake that up. And I think that's a lot of what Matt Colville's video is really about, to be honest. And, you know, with a, a goblin, uh, you can do just about anything with a, a manticore. You could have some interesting things as well. And I think this is a, a creature that, that opens you up to a lot of opportunities. So other ways of, of manipulating the action economy, honestly, I don't know if there's if there's much beyond always use minions, which we've talked about like a hundred times at this point, but I'll keep yelling to the heavens if I need to. Always have minions. Legendary actions are, are worthwhile and probably your best friend. Uh, and also, you know, kind of the, the half use of layer actions where it's less about them being in a layer and more of using that concept of something happens on initiative count five or 10 or whatever number you want. Uh, and maybe it's something that the PCs can stop if they perform a specific task. Right. And another thing with action economy where reinforcements are definitely your friends, it still falls into the same umbrella of use minions, but you're going to screw it up on yeah, a DM generally is going to make a lot of encounters and you're going to screw some of them up too hard or too easy. And if you want it to be a tough fight and they're just steamrolling it, it's like, ah, that was just the first wave. Here's four more. Right. Always a good play. Yeah, no, I've said that before. It's uh, people like limit themselves. Like the DM should not be limited almost at all. Like the players have to be obviously to make challenges and make cooperation friendly. But the DM, you are the master of the dungeon. If you want four more fucking goblins, you can have four more goblins. Right. You know, <laughs> unless you really, really squeeze yourself into some dumb situation where there's no plausible way for the goblins to get into this locked magical chamber or whatever, you know, just there's holes in the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> a bullet just digs up from the ground and joins the fray. Drops the goblins off. <laughs> bullet bus. <laughs> hey, that actually sounds kind of interesting. Maybe we should talk about yeah. the bullet. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So minions. Yeah. Are there, are there ways beyond minions though? Cause I think that's the thing that, that, a lot of people, including myself, kind of get tripped up on is it seems like minions always come down to just be like the end all be all. I don't think there's a good way to do this. Like this kind of where I diverge, like Matt Colville's video is important to watch. He does this with the Ankeg and he does a decent job of it. But I think the biggest issue is that when you just throw the action economy out of your favor as a DM, you are you're presented with very few options, especially if you have a party that just pours damage out like nobody's business you know there's just no way to prevent a single round nuclear bomb from going off and destroying your entire encounter that's true that's true because i mean even if mm -hmm. you know we're talking about a, a party that's just doing a hundred damage in a round uh you're you're not going to have a good opportunity to to just put a single enemy in front of them and not expect it to get decimated in a round or two. Uh, so at the end of the day, if even using some of these concepts from Matt Coville, I think you're still better off using them and having minions because then you get to do all of the cool stuff you set up for. Uh, otherwise, it's just going to be a round or two. Uh, and I I think the one thing that I've always found is it's, it's super easy to add minions, like of any sort. I've almost never once been in a scenario where I'm like, no, it only makes sense to have one of these creatures um you're fighting a fire elemental well here's four mini fire elementals that are just like kind of broken off from it who cares that's easy it's easy enough to make those types of creatures that are just weakened versions of whatever you're you're normally throwing at them right uh just kind of a counter to what you're saying about that uh, just going to be killed in two or three rounds. Sometimes that's okay. I actually, I think specifically in this video, he was expecting these fights to only last three rounds. That's right. why he only came with three different abilities. Each round does one ability, dead by the end of the third one. Burn some resources, memorable encounter. Right. Move on. So if, where I think it can fall a little flat, and, and this is more, I think, comes back to kind of philosophy you kind of take to this stuff, <laughs> where if it's, Let's say we're going to like build up a manticore here and it's a cool thing, but it's only it's by itself and it ends up being a random encounter and the party knows they're traveling and it's just going to be a random encounter. Yeah, they're going to nuke the thing from orbit, uh, get a long rest before the next encounter and it's not going to matter. And for some people, for some parties, that's fine because they was like, oh, we fought a manticore and it did this stuff and that was really cool and that's a memory and that's 
it. Other parties want to feel like, well, that wasn't a challenge. We know we could just burn anything on it and kill it, and that's that. I, I know that one's a little metagamey. That is what our group kind of falls into, though, where we could sometimes feel a little... I don't want to have cheated is the right word, and that, that's more like our problem, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, to some extent. I mean, it's. I think it's a, a fair complaint, though, obviously, because that's how we play it. But there... I guess these encounters can be memorable, but to me, they only feel memorable if they feel like there's actually a danger. There's only a danger yeah. if the if the resources that I'm expending aren't going to come back in 30 seconds. Um, it, it, I don't know. Right. It's like a random encounter in a video game where you're like, oh my God, I have to get through this. Like this just popped up. Maybe I'll get some experience. Cool. But otherwise, like this is just inhibiting me from continuing what I want to do. Uh, whereas right. when you kind of change it around and it's like, hey, this has long lasting effects. It's like, ooh, we need to finish this as quick as possible or else in the the next three fights, uh, we're going to have much less to, to Nova with. Right. Yeah. It's so if you do it as a random encounter, we, we've kind of gotten over this by adding the long rest rules where it takes a week while traveling. So basically saying while traveling, you don't get a long rest till you reach your destination. So then it's, we know, all right, we're going to kill this manticore. And like, it's not an immediate threat to us, but we burnt resources. We hurt ourselves a bit that that might come to bite us later. Right. And then it's very concrete when you're in a dungeon where like, you know, there's going to be encounter after encounter and traps and puzzles where you have to expend resources and stuff like that. And then it's a game of resource management and anything you use to kill, you know, that encounter on the manticore or whatever is something you will not have later. Yeah. It's just almost impossible to really challenge a fully equipped party without it making, making the fight really swingy. Uh, you know, where the enemy is doing 100 damage per turn, and then it's like, whoa, this is just going to be either a straight loss or they're going to blow this thing up in, in one or two turns. Right. Yeah, that's what Matt Colville went into that I think is the biggest problem and that's the biggest new mistake of trying to swing the action economy in your side when you don't have it. It turns into a duel that's not right. fun. Either they win the first round or everybody dies. It's just bad. <laughs> right, yeah. right. So that said, that is the entire point of this whole action economy manipulation is giving you tools to work with to make it a fun, memorable fight without just adding damage, without just adding health. Um, health is probably still going to be necessary to add. At the end of the day, if you want your fights to last longer, give them more health. I don't think there's any complications there. More health. Um, so if you want the Manticore uh, to last more than three rounds against a level five party, maybe you give it 100 health instead of 68. Regardless, um, <laughs> any other thoughts on the action economy before we actually start building a Manticore using these concepts? Never increase the AC of your monster like beyond one or two points. You've brought that up before. That's Ever. Ever, ever, <laughs> ever. It's the least fun thing you it's can true. do. It's true. It's not fun to miss. I've definitely made that mistake before where I'm like, oh, they hit all the time. Same. Let me do 22 AC. And then it's just like nothing hits ever. And then the fun gets sucked out rather yeah, quickly. I remember in, in our Out of the Abyss campaign, I had you guys fight the Lonely, Ugh, which is... I remember the stupid we had, fight. Yeah. <laughs> we, we had a whole episode on these things, the Sorrow Sworn. It might have been multiple, so you, you could find them in our backlog of stuff. But yeah, this, this was one where it made sense where you'd fight it alone, but it was... Kind of like an important story moment, so I want to make it tough. So I kind of attempted to do some of the stuff and screwed it up. <laughs> Where any time it had somebody buy it, it got a boost to every single stat, and it had an ability to draw people in. So all four of you were by it, and it ended, its AC ended up being like six higher, and you guys just couldn't hit it. Yep. I, I remember. I think I had to fudge some rolls by the end of it. Otherwise, it would have been a <laughs> That's okay. Which is like, wouldn't have been fun because like I messed with it completely and overtuned it. Right. Like, oh shit, that's, yeah. And that's, so you got to be careful about that. Yeah. And I mean, that that's definitely going to happen. I think, Will, you're totally in the right there where the main way that you can mess that up is just making it impossible to hit the creature. Because if they, if they can't hit it, it's just going to keep going. This is something that I felt for a very long time. And it's when, in the few times I have DM'd, I actually do this. It's a little bit of work, but go through the fights in your head 
with the absolute basic, like the first thing you think the party will do, the first thing you'll do as a DM, it'll suss out issues. If you realize, oh, fuck, my party is doing zero damage to this monster because it's immune to player damage. <laughs> huh. I think I fucked this encounter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did. And it's not fun to TPK the party and then be like, well, uh, let's just retcon the entire session because I fucked right, up, guys. Right. Sorry. No, you, you just go through it. If, you know, you find a huge issue, then you have to, then you can right. deal with it. And I, I think I did that like for probably 30 minutes straight of me just sitting there and kind of thinking about how things would go with that recent Kraken fight that you guys had because I was really <laughs> nervous yeah. about that. I mean, when you're throwing a base challenge rating 23 at a level nine party there's a lot of ways that that can just go poorly so i'm like all right if i start the fight by lightning bolting them all um okay i might accidentally down one or two people and then the fight's basically over so like trying to you know craft out the first three or four rounds of play uh is is really worthwhile i i do it all the time mainly because There's a lot of times where I look back and I think, oh, I didn't really do the most opportune thing for this thing at the start of the fight. Uh, Instead of going straight to its its one very useful ability, I just made a a single attack. Because I'm like, well, it's the first round, so I don't know, they just kind of attack. No, you gotta let it plan that all out, map it out, think about what spells the party's going to have. I mean, I I always look at your guys' spell list. I know it better than you at this point. Yeah, and especially with the Kraken fight, I think that shows that you did that because that, as you said, is a really kind of precarious situation. Like, because we we weren't intended to kill it, we were intended to escape because it could absolutely just decimate us without really thinking about it. Right. And it could have very, if you weren't careful on how you set that up and, you know, gave the personality to the Kraken of how you wanted to play it, they, I mean, that could have been a TPK in two rounds. Yeah. And, so I think you struck a really good balance. It yeah. would have been me shrugging and being like, oh, I guess that was a bad thing to throw at you guys. Like, as if this isn't my fourth year DMing. Like, <laughs> Idiots. Right. Couldn't even take a crack at it. How long yeah. have you guys been playing? <laughs> but at the same time, you don't want to take it so far where it's like really clear. It's like, oh, there's no way we're going to actually lose this. That felt like it struck a good balance. Like, we could have got away and, and we did. But if we didn't play it smart and acted fast and, you know, it t- took some risks... That yeah, we could have died. Yeah, very much. I think so. You struck a good balance there. Thank you. I'm the best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and make a manticore. Trying to use some of these these concepts, and we've actually never done this before. We've never like built a monster together or tweaked one together. It's usually done in a vacuum. Um, so I'm I'm actually kind of excited for this. Um, and most likely you guys will, will see this manticore, but everybody who's listening will be able to see it. I plan on making this in D and D beyond and just sharing it when the episode comes out. Uh, so if you like what we come up with, it'll be around first things first. Uh, I say we double its fly speed, triple its AC and quadruple its health. (laughs) Why can't it use all of its tail spikes at once? It can, it can do, oh, 24. (laughs) Yeah, that's just dumb. So, I don't see an issue with 24d8 plus, let's just call that 75. So um, actually, one of the first things that I, I did think of as a cool action to add for this is doing like a AoE volley attack where it like mm-hmm. shoots up a bunch of its spikes and just, you know, covers a, a 10 by 10 area or maybe 20 by 20. Yeah, I say I think utilizing the spikes, that's it's probably its most unique thing. Right. The spikes that grow off of this that it could shoot out as a projectile. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, an AoE valley or um like a burst of them for hitting things if like if it gets surrounded. Oh, that'd be neat. Where it's like on the ground for some reason and it's just like does a like spins around shooting them out. Yeah. That's really neat. I like that a lot. Alright. So this is the hard part, because we have to think about it, like, round by round. Let's say, how long do we want this thing to last for? It's challenge rating three. We're not expecting it to be crazy long. What's three, three, four rounds? Since it could fly, I, yeah, boost the rounds. That'll be around a little bit, because, like, your paladin's not going to be able to just run up and smite right. it. Even if it has, even if someone has fly or something like that, it's going to take a round to set up in region. So, yeah, four, four rounds, maybe. Okay, that seems pretty reasonable. So tweaking its health that's always party specific but you know 
let's say you you want this thing to last a little longer. 68 might not be enough if you have people who are good with ranged attacks. So I may throw that up to probably 85 or so, somewhere around there. Keep it under 100 as that seems a bit much. Uh, and honestly, mm-hmm. its AC is probably fine at 14. I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, with, with you limiting who can attack it since it will be flying, um, you want the people who can hit it to be able to hit it. It also kind of fits. I've always felt like AC, um, any kind of dissonance with what I'm thinking should be the difficulty of hitting something and the actual difficulty of hitting it bugs the shit out right. of me. <laughs> and this is, you know, a flying giant yeah. lion monster. It should have the AC of a flying giant <laughs> lion monster. <laughs> That's a great point. Where if you start to say, oh, it's a, it's an armor plated giant lion monster. It's like, come on. It's like, no. No, it's not. It doesn't have that. Take it off. <laughs> Fix this combat. That would be kind of cool as a minion, though, if they if they made Manticore armor. But yeah, that's like a well funded yeah <laughs> army who Spooky has a Manticore counterpoint to a Griffin. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, yeah. As for its its normal attack actions, I feel like those are completely fine. Um, as we've talked about, they already do pretty significant damage for a challenge rating three. What's what are some like? reactions maybe that you could think of for this creature that if, if we're talking about it being up high in the sky, it's not going to be like always getting opportunity attacks. It's not going to be using its reaction otherwise. Well, a reaction to fly away without provoking an opportunity attack. Yeah, that was what I was kind of thinking. Maybe even add some damage to that. They let out like a tail spike kind of volley in just a general direction and fly 30 feet back. Okay. Yeah. Or uh, I think dragons and stuff have this where they could kind of, I think the term is buffet their wings, where they do a really strong flap and it kind of launches them in the air and anything around it needs to make a strength saving throw, be knocked prone. Oh, I like that. Just taking away the the strength saving throw maybe because, you know, or or unless you did like a strength saving throw to remove the opportunity attack. So like it it does its its wing flap, which obviously isn't going to be as strong as a dragon's, um, but then you make a DC... 15 uh, strength saving throw and if you fail you can't take your reaction against it you can't take your opportunity attack yeah or again just not knock it knock them back and it gets it for free because i was thinking it's just to kind of build escalating levels of this fight maybe it does start on the ground right playing kind of dumb because it maybe doesn't realize you're you're an adventuring party. Like if this, a manticore coming across four commoners, just like out in the woods, those four commoners are fine. Right. They're not going to stand any chance of defeating this. Thing. Right. So it's probably not going to expend a lot of energy to take these things on. And so it starts off with that. It just like runs up and pounces and claws and bites on one of them and realizes, Oh, it's kind of actually okay. And then it gets stabbed and then blast of fire. And it's like, Oh shit. I need to actually be smart about this. These guys are powerful. So once it hits like a certain health threshold or something, uses its reaction to blast itself up with its wings, pushing everybody back. Okay. No, I think and that's it a... shoots, you know, 50 feet up and then starts raining down spikes. That's a great point. I, I really like that idea. So yeah, maybe give it a reaction to just flap its wings uh, and either just no opportunity attacks. That's just straight up. And then maybe like a low strength saving throw to not get pushed back five feet, which yeah. isn't going to change again, does much. Does that even matter? Say, it's, yeah, it's not if, it's, if it could, shoots 50 feet in the air. <laughs> yeah, it's just kind of like, it's a reaction to gain the owl's flyby ability right. for a turn. Right. <laughs> and it can move up to its speed. Yeah. I think that's pretty Yeah, fair. something like that. And then round two is when I'd break out that, that AOE volley, where it just like rain down some spikes from the sky. Uh, in like a a less calculated way. So it's like just a, a quick continuing that idea of it's just like trying to get away for a second and distance itself instead of taking like three well set up tail spikes or in addition of these three, three well shot out tail spikes is just throwing out a volley of however many. I mean, we're not going to put the 24 limitation right. on this one because that's just kind of silly. But I think like a, a, a big area makes sense to me like if it's 50 feet up a 20 by 20 doesn't seem too outlandish that absurd no throw a deck save on there yeah maybe take yeah i say yeah deck save the counterpoint i would make is that this is a very easy to visualize area of effect because you've got individual spikes right so yeah that's what the deck save is for if you pass it and you manage to kind of dance around the spikes fall and if not you get hit what i'm wondering is if the 
I don't like to do it, but I almost kind of do like make it like that. And because it is individual spikes, failing the deck save particularly badly actually makes the situation Mm. worse. You know, okay. if you get like a three on your deck save, you take a multiple of these spikes to the chest. I would go away from damage on this because I think you're going to get enough damage out of whatever you normally do. Um, but I think removing uh, or restraining the creature from the spikes would be a, a good way to go about that. I don't know. That feels weird about doing damage. No, 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 no. There's still damage. I'm saying okay. with the... Oh, the, okay. It's to say to restrain them, they have to be impaled correct, by them. Correct, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm saying like it's a DC 13 deck saving throw. If you fail, you take 2d8 damage. If you fail by five or more, then you take 2d8 and you're restrained. Okay. Yeah, I, I can give me that. I'm not sure how much that's going to do. Yeah. Like in favor of It's going to take an action. Because of their mobility. It's going to take them an action if they want to move, for one. So now if the, the manticore is 50 feet away and you've got a, a short bow that does has 30 foot range, I think. Or no, I'm sorry. They can get 100 feet away. So they're 100 feet away. Your thing's only 60 feet. Now you can't get closer unless you take an action to remove the spike. Well, if they're 100 feet away, I, I would think it would be straight up. Sure. Straight up. It doesn't matter. It's still, it's still distance. Yeah. But then it doesn't matter if you're restrained or not. Ah, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Well. Uh, except for ex- they would have advantage on their tail spike attack to hit you. That's. Okay. That's definitely good. That's about about it. Also, if they come down for the kill on um, like the next round or later rounds, then that could definitely be a, a worthwhile thing as well. And that was another reaction that I was thinking of is in the lore where it specifically states that, you know, it. it flies up high, it waits there until it sees an opportune moment to strike and and go in for the kill. Um, I could definitely see an ability that when somebody hits, I don't know, let's say three quarters health or something like that, or maybe just bloodied. I don't know how you want to go about that. Probably bloodied is actually a good point. Could give it a reaction to move up to its fly speed and take a bite attack. Or try and grapple it and fly away. Yeah, that'd be interesting too. It's like a free grapple. Would that slow it down that much with it being a large creature? You could just say it doesn't. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> I mean, we're just... That's fair. It can grapple and, and just fly yeah. away. So also restraint gives the creature disadvantage on their attacks, so... Oh, that's super worthwhile. Yeah, then. it would be. My... Yeah. I don't... Uh, like, I intuitively don't see why that would happen. And it's a probably good situation to say just drops to zero, you know? Say which part? I'm sorry. Like, instead of it being restrained, you make it your speed drops gotcha. to zero. Gotcha. Just because you're saying realistically your your like arms aren't restrained. You're just you're saying that the yeah. Yeah. impales your legs to some manner. And I, that's one of the lessons Matt Kova was going into is like do not limit yourself to like the kit in the game. They do that because they write books for millions right. of people. You're a DM, you can just make this shit up and no one's gonna break <laughs> it. Yeah, but then the the party speed dropping to zero, it just doesn't seem like it would have a large impact then. And to me, that just goes back to if you fail by five or more, you hit, get hit by more spikes and take more damage. Hmm. This is the issue with doing it collaboratively. How do I tell you guys are tell you that you're all stupid without sounding mean? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is my issue. Every time I talk to anyone ever. I, all right. So I'll stressful. say that they, they would both be interesting and I'd like to see how they'd play out. Um, I agree. I don't think the yeah. movement would be as debilitating uh, because we expect this thing to fly up. That said, I think it might be a little difficult to just fly up 100 feet and expect it to come and swoop down for a kill. In, in my eyes, it's going to get as high as it needs to be to stay out of the most of the fire but maybe it's not going to the the edge of the world here uh, because it wants right. to be able to come in and and grab somebody and grapple them away when the time comes so i think those kind of pair well counterpoint go ahead. that's a super not fun how is that mechanic. not fun because <laughs> like when it goes badly it's the worst thing ever it's like oh the uh, the monk got taken away well Take it away where? <laughs> to his nest, to be eaten. He's being eaten right now. Yes. You should be rerolling This can be character. dangerous. I think that should be pretty clear. But if it's a scenario where, you know, first couple rounds, the party does 30 damage. Uh, second round, it does this volley. Third round, it's coming in, swooping attack and grabbing somebody. And it's not moving them 100 feet. It's moving them maybe, maybe 50 feet at most because it's going to have to use its movement to get down and that will be 
again, 50 feet of movement. And then what, does it get an extra 50 feet to take it away? Probably not it's going to have to use its flyby or something uh, in order to get out of there. So there's going to be a couple of turns where the party can still do damage and the person grappled can do damage. Maybe it grapples the paladin. Big fucking mistake, Manticore, because now you're getting smited. Yeah, yeah, I think there's enough ways to get out of it. Yeah, it's like, I guess in theory it could go terribly and then that character is lost, but that's true for any combat. Right, right. It's not just a one, it's not like it just comes down to one roll. You would absolutely play out it flying away. Everyone's still getting its turn. The grappled character still getting its turn. Right. And now it's a matter of like, we need to stop this thing before it takes the player away. And Paul. yeah. And, and now the player's going to probably fall out of the sky, which sucks too. No, I said Paul. Paul. Oh, the player Paul. I was naming, I was naming the monk. Okay. His name's Paul. Oh. Before, before the man's core eats Paul. Okay. Yeah. That's that. right. Yeah. So now that we really care about Paul, uh, <laughs> we don't want him to get eaten. So I think, uh, yeah, the, the party's going to focus it. They already have been focusing it. It doesn't change anything beyond the fact that it feels more dangerous. It's just as dangerous as it was mm-hmm. before. Only now it's, you know, 50 feet away and carrying Paul. Who's going to stunning strike it yeah. because he's a monk. Right. <laughs> And so this is this is uh, back to when I was saying dress rehearsals. It's also important when you're doing these or just rehearsals in your head, like do best case, mid case, worst case to figure out just like because roles don't right. always go well. Like you want you want your worst case fights to have threats, but like Paul went down when he got that uh, grapple attack, and you know we don't have anyone with a range over the over thirty feet, and now he's fifty feet away. It's like. All right. right. Just like just having right. that in mind means like maybe you don't, you know, grab Paul by the head and <laughs> carry him away. For <laughs> sure. And that comes down to knowing your party where I would not even, I wouldn't even put this thing against a party that didn't have any range over 30 feet. Unless you're yeah. such a dick. Yeah. yeah. And let's see. Now that said, once it does get like away and it has somebody in its grasps, you, you really need to make sure that this is towards the end of the fight because once it can just dash away for a hundred feet, then it's going to start becoming quickly impossible to, to catch up to this. Which is why you don't grab the player when they're at zero. You grab them when they're at half, or whatever, and it's still possible for the person who's being held to fight back. Now, worst case scenario is they solo the monster uh, while it's shooting tail spikes behind it at, at the party, the rest of the party following, and Paul just lays in some punches, and then he drops out of the sky... And that's really cool. Maybe he goes down when he hits because he just took 5d6 damage on top of that. And your party has to sprint 100 feet away to stabilize him before he actually dies. All of this sounds really cool to me. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Those are the types of moments you live for. Yeah. Well, not us. We're safe, comfy people. Our characters live for. No, this is what I, Jared, live for. I throw rocks at eagles just to spite them. I crash cars when I'm bored just to get a little thrill out of my life. (laughs) Don't throw rocks at eagles or crash cars, people. We do not condone that activity. Um, I I don't know. Depends on the eagle. (laughs) Please, Will, don't. If he starts shit with you, if he starts shit with you. A warning rock's fine. Just don't aim for it. Just like a reminder that, hey, I got hands. You don't. (laughs) Throw these hands, man. (laughs) I theory crab monsters for Dungeons and Dragons. I know how this is going to (laughs) go. So another cool thing to add on, this not so much like a reaction action economy thing, just to kind of boost the difficulty, make it more interesting, is some sort of poison effect to the tail spikes. Yeah, I was thinking about that too. I think that would be fitting. Uh, If you want that to also escalate, you could sort of play it where, you know, once the adrenaline rushes through, it starts increasing the potency of this poison in the manticore, and it takes a couple rounds to escalate. In first round, it's just save against the poison effects. Uh, Next round, the versus the being paralyzed, such as through like a whole person, stuff like that. Yeah, that could be good. You kind of escalate it. I can see a lot of paths. And that's actually something great to visualize too. You can be like, all right, this you fought manacores before, but this one's like greenish. It's it's, spikes are (laughs) dripping as the intensity gets higher on this poison. You know, it's like these things are just it's just like oozing out of its tail as it produces. You see it hitting the ground and like smoke rises up. 
yeah. grass dies around yeah, it. Like yeah. Shit that you're like, your party just looks at yeah. and goes, uh, is that going to hit us? And you just smile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, if you want to make it real dangerous, like the third level, then it's save against the kind of permanent poison, that sort of ongoing effect. You, your max health decreases every day by a D8, and if it hits zero, you die, and you need a greater restoration to cure. That, that sort of thing. Right. That's really party dependent how tough you want to make and, that. And level. I mean, if it's like level yeah. eight or something, <laughs> then that's not that huge of a deal. Level two. Yeah. <laughs> I fucking hate that mechanic. I, it's like, oh, if you fail one save and you don't get a wish spell, your <laughs> eyes melt out of your head. <laughs> wow, I'm having a blast. Depends on how difficult you make it or, or you know, how, how devastating you make it. Yeah, because it's not about how difficult it is. It's, it's just right. a roll. Right. But you, right. It's about- usually it's a roll every day. And maybe it's even like a roll every day. And if you succeed, it doesn't go away, but it doesn't happen on that day. And it gives you plenty of time to deal with it as a party. That said, right. I'm not going to do that if you're all in the middle of, I don't know, the the desert or something uh, and weeks away from a cleric. I have done that, but <laughs> <laughs> but I wouldn't do that with yeah. a random encounter. Right. And then with this, another issue what that type of effect is a lot of times it's either like it's a very big deal and someone may die from it or you have a cleric who just has greater restoration mm-hmm. and they spend a spell slot and it's fine uh, but you, you something dms need to remember is they could just say you don't know how to do this now magic's not typical greater restoration is not having an effect you need to this is now a quest right. to heal your teammate who's going to slowly die over the next few weeks unless you do something about this. And then obviously you need to plan it out and all that. But Right. One thing I've been a really big fan of is sure greater restoration will work if you have the right material component where this specific venom is you need the anti-venom and you need to have that, that restoration spell. So maybe even a lesser restoration spell works fine, but you need the root of this weird plant that's, you know, a couple days travel away and it's a day's travel to the nearest city to find that information out. And I think it, it gives a little bit more weight to those types of things. So it's not just like, oh, lesser right. restoration healed, but you also don't need to be, you know, level eight. Is that when greater restoration comes up? Or that's nine, actually. Level nine is when you get greater restoration. Is it a, if it's a fifth, fifth level, level, it's level nine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you don't have to be at, at fifth level to, or ninth level in order to, no, no, yeah. to get cool moments like that because i feel like lesser restoration yeah. is super boring yeah i like that the material component of it it was supposed to come up it was with a side quest you guys ignored <laughs> i love it i'm quests. all right with it it happens it empowers my agency <laughs> hey save this thing no <laughs> that is the most thrilling moment for me as a player is just saying no to a thing I'm, you want me to do. I don't even mind. I really, it almost never bothers me. Like I might bring it up in a joking way of like, oh man, you guys missed all this stuff. Um, but I don't know. It just, it just kind of stops being a, a, an issue. You get used to it. I want you guys to feel like you can say no to things. All right. Any other cool abilities with the Manticore? It's a, this would be taken in a completely another direction. I, not something we want to build because it'd be complicated. Just kind of an idea to throw out there because the Manticore, it kind of has that chimera vibe. Of just, it's sort of like a mishmash of different things. Humanoid head, tiger body, dragon wings. If if it's kind of a more horror, kind of gross campaign where as you fight this thing, it sort of rips itself apart and these different aspects form its own. So it's you have it as trigger once it hits a certain amount of health, like something's causes like a huge gash in its neck and you think oh it should be dead then its head just sort of i'm kind of almost picturing like the thing you know the the monsters and that its head sort of just kind of extends out from the gash in its neck and this like terrible sort of humanoid-esque grotesque form pulls itself out and now you got to fight that but also the decapitated lion body still going as well right and that that kind of solves the issue of the action economy, it sort of actually increases as you go. But then you need to be building these different sort of horror monsters and like, all right, what's the head in its weird form going to do? And now the decapitated lion body. And if you cut off a wing, does a dragon grow off of it? You know, kind of like the uh, the troll has the mechanics in there. Oh, yeah. right, right. Now, I would probably, uh, if I was doing that, would start with just like, I mean, a dragon head grows like a, a tiny little dragon head that can now breathe fire. 
So now it has a recharge ability of six, and, and it can do that. Or, or even something smaller. It just spits out an acid glob. I mean, there's options there that could be kind of cool. Yeah. Not realistic, but who cares? It's like... Yeah, just make it kind of man. Let's make, <laughs> make it cool. A cool Mera. All right. Anything else around the Mana Core? I think this is pretty cool. I don't know if we have like one definitive one that we've created, but I'm definitely going to use this to create a monster in D&D Beyond, at least around that that first one. No, I got nothing else. All right. Then that's it. Goodbye, everyone. Cool. Kevin, Bye. say it. Say it. I can't end the episode until listening. you say it. It doesn't feel I did, right. You talked over me saying Do it. Do the thing. Bit. Do the thing. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Oh, thank God. Next time on Monsters of Multiclass. Join us as we discuss the Paladin Warlock Multiclass and Kruthix from Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes. And another segment of Ask Monsters of Multiclass. <laughs> <laughs>